So I just wanted to welcome everybody, uh, all our uh, speakers, teachers here, and also all the people who are Cyber Sangha, everybody who's listening here. So first of all, I wanted to welcome Lama Sultan, uh, Talekandro, uh, Lama Rinzin Droma and Klein, uh, Sharon Salzberg, Marcy Mom, and uh, of course, uh, Anya, who is uh, dealing with all these <laughs> technical challenges behind the scene. So, uh, so I wanted to welcome, first of all, I'm very, very honored, very, very happy to have you all here. I've been uh, wanting to have, uh, invite this for some time ago, also among other Tibetan teachers, female teachers, I wanted to bring together, but it was been a little bit uh, challenging to uh, have everybody come, but but eventually, hopefully more and more, we will be able to invite, have more discussion. So very happy. And uh, just wanted to say a few words about overview about these. Some people are watching maybe first time. So um, on my personal Facebook Live, I've been teaching on five wisdom for quite for some time. And uh, each, each one, and then so, uh, also, uh, we, we were hoping like during this, uh, this conversation, we have invited all the teachers here to you know, share a little bit about uh, your lineage, uh, your sources of your teaching and uh, your own personal journey, your awakening experiences, and somehow how these pers deep personal experiences that if we wanted to give like a hard advice to students in a way, it's a very, very short time, but very, at least I think some sense, whatever hard advice that everybody can give to all the students, I think that would be very, very welcome. And then whatever the conversations continuously arises, also welcome. And also uh, September 6th, we have already posted there September 6th, uh, we have invited uh, in the Tibetan Buddhism, we have six different schools. So they're all the, from six different schools, we have um, invited like scholars and campus to specifically talk on also five wisdoms so that each from, from, from their own tradition, sometimes they are a little different way of explaining what five wisdoms are. So. Uh, we have asked them to, you know, uh, do that. It will be in Tibetan and then we will translate it in English. So, so we hope that uh, discussion here on, you know, like a five Dakini, uh, five Buddha family, five wisdom, five element, you know, these some sense of flow of conversation uh, that the people can kind of build on something. So this is our wish. So. Uh, so the, today's kind of the the way the sequence will work is first of all uh, there will be two sessions of meditation. Uh, first, uh, Telekandro uh, we has offered to do in the beginning. So then, uh, and the end we will have a, a little conversation, a group conversation. After that, Marcy has offered to do the the meditation. So so we will be very much looking forward to hear from all of you and also uh, join with this uh, meditation together. So thank you very much once again. So welcome. So I will first invite Talikandro to, to lead a meditation. Extraordinary uh, group of people and no doubt some um, exceptional uh, uh, listeners and practitioners. Um, fairly straightforward, um, really. Um, uh, I thought we could start with a couple of minutes of just tranquility meditation where we just relax, perhaps use the breath as a focus. Uh, and then I wanted to move on to, uh, once we've settled the mind, to using uh, expansion and contraction uh, to create uh, first the spacious, open, expansive uh, aspect of the mind. Uh, and so we expand beyond our skin, obviously, be beyond the walls that we find ourselves in. Uh, and then to draw back 
into a, a finer, smaller aspect. Um, and to just repeat this slowly over the next few minutes before we finish with just some more uh, tranquility meditation. So I hope you'll be um, happy to join in with this with me. Um, uh, and from time to time, I may just uh, provide a little bit of guidance as we go, uh, which may be useful for you. Um, so let's just begin. Um, and uh, normally, if possible, the spine is straight, uh, however we may be sitting. Um, and that we really do our very best to relax the body in this uh, straight spine sort of position. So it's very easy to start building tension. So we just want to physically feel relaxed. Uh, and then we're just going to watch the breath for about two minutes. Um, and equally, if sometimes even following the breath can be a little tricky, that one can simply uh, maintain an awareness of the spaciousness of the mind. And so we'll just be watching the breath, aware of the spaciousness of the mind, two minutes. Continuing to rest the mind for about another minute. We are going to move on to the uh, activity aspect of the meditation, uh, expansion and contraction, or we can also call it loosening and tightening. Uh, so uh, first of all, we're going to expand. So expanding the mind, um, and we can uh, feel quite uh, as if the mind is filling uh, the body. And so it's a very a, a sense of fullness and richness. Uh, and then we are aware of uh, the shape, if you like, that the body finishes at the skin. And then we expand beyond the skin. With the same sense of fullness and richness. And further, we expand beyond the walls that uh, we find ourselves within. Uh, and so we uh, have a sense of uh, uh, unlimited expansion. So we build that sense of uh, extending uh, in all the directions, uh, unlimited expansiveness of the mind.
And then gradually we begin to draw the mind in from the expansiveness, we draw the mind in just gently and slowly until it becomes like a, a tiny uh, tigle, a, a tiny moment. Continue to bring relaxation to the meditation, sense of relaxation and uh, uh, focus in this instance. Or a tight focus. And again, we're going to begin to expand the mind. So we're taking it from that the drop, the tigle, uh, and uh, filling our body with a fullness and richness of mind. The expansive quality of mind. Really filling uh, the body to the skin and then beyond the skin, as if the body loses its parameters so that we uh, uh, have a sense of, of the mind as it ex expands out, filling the room and then beyond the room, uh, extending uh, in, in an unlimited manner, unlimited manner um, in all the directions. Continue to expand the mind um, and we can, any thoughts or discomforts that may arise um, uh, in this meditation um, are accommodated. So we allow uh, any seeming disturbances of the mind uh, to be um, uh, not pushed away, uh, not necessarily welcomed, we try to uh, arrest our tendency for aversion and attraction. So we have an unconditional, if you like, acceptance of the creative aspect of rising and falling of activity as we expand the mind, bringing it uh, to a, uh, an expansive richness and fullness. And when we're ready, we gently begin to draw the mind in just to a central uh, tigle. So we just, or a, just a, a, a drop in the heart center, we just gently draw the mind in. We're still allowing any activity of the mind to, to uh, arise. Uh, you know, remain, if it remains, 
and dissipate of its own accord without injecting anything uh, ourselves within what arises in the mind. So we're drawing the mind back to a drop in the heart particularly. And then again, we're going to bring a sense of spaciousness to the mind. Um, so um, we start to expand the mind uh, while we return to tranquility meditation and just rest the mind with a relaxed body, straight spine, um, and just watch the breath or just relax in a experience of spaciousness just for this minute or so as we conclude the meditation. Just allowing the mind to rest. Okay. Thank you so much. It was, was wonderful meditation. So just for all our audience, I'll remind, remind you that when each teacher will be speaking, there will be information about their website, their work, their teaching schedules, whatever information um, is available there. Anya will help and provide. So I'll just let everybody know that. So, so I wanted to invite Lama Sultan. Please welcome. Thank you. So, I, there's various subjects that I've been asked to talk about. The lineage of sources of wisdom, personal experiences and heart advice, and practical implications, right? So, I think I, I would begin with the present moment, the present time, what's happening now in, in Buddhism with women, um, with uh, Buddhism having its own Me Too moment. Um, and uh, this is something that has been going on for a long time. And um, it's, it's uh, unfortunate that it's also in our own backyard. And at the same time, I think it's an exciting moment because there's a possibility of a shift in um, what has been um, a system that has not particularly friendly to women. Um, and into a more inclusive system. Um, and I, I just don't think we can talk about this today without talking about that. And uh, so a difficult, difficult um, subject, but um, important 
that this is brought forth and hopefully some healing and change will happen within the structures that have governed Tibetan Buddhism. So I just want to mention that because it's kind of the elephant in the room, I think. Um, and uh, I'll talk about uh, the other subjects, but I just wanted to bring that into the room because this is, uh, is happening and um, it's a big deal within um, that Buddhism right now. So um, lineage, um, my personal lineage began really with His Holiness the 16th Karmapa uh, when I was ordained in 1970 in Bodh Gaya by him. And I studied in Kargu tradition until about 1978. Um, and I studied with Trungpa Rinpoche um, Abu Rinpoche, Kala Rinpoche, um, and I moved from between Asia and America at that time and moved from being a nun to being a mother of three. So for me, my, I guess you could say awakening into the feminine in Buddhism was the um, death of my daughter, Chiara, in 1980. And um, she was a twin. And she passed away in the night of sudden infant death. And when that happened, I really needed the stories of women. Um, the story of the Buddha wasn't helping me. The story of Milarepa didn't help me. I needed the stories of women and I couldn't find them. And then I began to look for them because of my really my own personal need and found the six stories that are in Women of Wisdom. And so that process of discovering that I needed the feminine and then finding some sources, but realizing how few there really are. You know, they always say, oh yeah, there's women. Uh, one, two, three. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, that, um, that situation uh, is changing. I mean, here we have women teachers here. Um, and I would like to see more Tibetan women teachers um, or him, from the Himalayan countries that represent actually this tradition. But I think we, we are in a somewhat privileged position as Western women um, and have been treated differently because of that. And so that's why we're sitting here and they're not because of that. And um, yeah, there's so many things I could say about it, but um, my work uh, now has been focused around this new book, Wisdom Rising, Journey into the Mandala of the Empowered Feminine. And it's based around the mandala and the five families and so what I have seen tying together where I started with what's happening with women now is that there's a fierceness that's arising in women now, um, a coming into that, um, into the anger um, in, that we saw in the Women's March and also in Me Too and time is up. 
So that um, anger without wisdom cannot be as effective for change. And so I see the mandala and the mandala of the five dakinis as a potential template of empowerment, I N empowerment, from which to draw for the changes that we are seeing and that we need to see and to transform um, the anger into fierceness, fierceness that's based in compassion. So the mandala to me is very important. It's interesting that you're um, going to be talking about this more in the five families that I talk about extensively in this book. There's a chapter on each family in it. And so the mandala is a template of wholeness. And so if we place our minds within that template of wholeness of the mandala, and in this case, the mandala of the five daikinis who are fierce and wise, manifestations of the feminine, then that becomes a resource for transformation. And that's essentially uh, what I'm suggesting in this book is that to see the change that we need to see in the relative world and you know, it might seem, oh, though well, that's political, but Gandhi said, anyone who thinks the spiritual is not political doesn't understand what the spiritual is. So we are seeing social change and um, we have methods that can support social change and the, the Dakinis, which are fierce manifestations of wisdom in the Tibetan tradition can serve as a tool or a base for that transformation and empowerment tool to draw on. And thank you so much, Lama Sultan. That was wonderful. So I uh, wanted to move on. Uh, Telekandu, please welcome. Talk about, uh, I wanted to talk about both despair and confidence on the path. Um, uh, and uh, I wanted to read a couple of translations from, I should first of all begin to say that uh, I was brought up uh, uh, in, from a Buddhist perspective in the Kagyu predominantly, but the Kagyu and Nyingma tradition, uh, Charlie Krimbashe, um, was also really Rime uh, and was interested in philosophy and psychology uh, and comparative work. Um, and so that was my, I guess you could say, spiritual uh, upbringing. Uh, so uh, let me just, uh, it, these are two verses that I wanted to read from Nagajima's letter to a friend, um, which is a, a, a translation um, uh, of one of Charlie Karimbache's books. Um, Refrain from harmful acts to satisfy superiors, monastics, deities, parents, siblings, royalty, ministers, and attendants, because there is no way to share the fruits of your negative karma. Um, and I, I'll touch on this in terms of the idea of confidence on the path. Um, and um, uh, and uh, uh, avoiding being tempted uh, by superiors or people who appear to be in power and really always having one's own ethics resonate. Um, and then uh, this is another one that I think is important for uh, any of us to consider on the spiritual path when it has to do with ethics. So it reads, adding a small amount of salt changes the taste of a little water, 
while it would not change that of a great river. Similarly, small non-virtuous deeds will not spoil a fast river of virtue. And uh, from a spiritual, I think, uh, a spiritual religious uh, perspective, um, I think um, many, perhaps I'm uh, mainly speaking of uh, practitioners, perhaps, or Western Buddhists, I'm not sure, uh, arguably, um, uh, is that we come to, we seek uh, to have a spiritual life because of altruistic motives, uh, that we think that ourselves and the world can be better than we see it. And this is often where the despair comes from. The despair can come also from what we see within ourselves. Um, and so there's, a, there's some kind of fundamental criticism that comes along with being spiritually minded and looking into the mind. And this can create a great uh, division in ourselves of what we uh, love and what we hate about ourselves and the world or what we have attraction to and what we have aversion to. Um, and um, I think that the, the aspect of um, allowing, allowing that which we have aversion to uh, in our minds to have uh, be given air for uh, us to build a relationship with that which we seek to have no relationship with. Um, uh, often in meditation, uh, people will describe, I know this, and I'm describing this because it's, it's a description of my own journey, uh, a, a journey that seems to, this description seems to be shared with many people that I've spoken with, um, uh, is that um, we develop a very um, uh, constrained, um, and critical view of our meditation. So we perhaps will only be willing to sit with the still mind uh, and have little uh, respect for the active mind. Um, and so, you know, we refer to things like dull dullness and agitation, but I think it's, it, you know, it's a deeper, it's deeper uh, than that. It's it's I like the way I'm presenting in my mind today, or I hate the way I'm presenting in my mind today. And I think for um, anybody on the spiritual path, uh, we have to manage our minds, and our minds have a tendency to be chaotic, partly because of the, the, our creative aspect, our cognitive abilities, um, and um, allowing ourselves to have a many, many manifestations in the mind uh, and giving that room um, uh, allows us to build relationship, whatever arises in the mind. And the more we can build a relationship with, with our aversions in particular, um, uh, the less hold they have on us and our sense of self, our self-esteem um, uh, and the less, uh, that relationship, if it's if it's sort of severed or um, uh, has an aspect of repulsion to it, um, that the the more um, uh, we're in a position to just stay with it, uh, that the relationship, the moment that we stay with something that has in the past uh, repulsed us or um, uh, we haven't wanted to look at, the moment that we stay with that. We've become the uh, we've become a master of our own mind a little more than we were just before. So the idea of gradual enlightenment, I think, in a sense, um, uh, for practitioners, is it can be important not to always look at how far enlightenment is away, but how far we've come as practitioners. So if we've become more aware that the mind is chaotic, more aware of, of our um, uh, aversions uh, and attractions. Um, and that there's, uh, in our meditation, there's a, 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 an equality uh, then uh, uh, in how we uh, relate to whatever arises in the mind, that that is tremendously liberating 
uh, and when we have confidence that we can stay with that which we have a strong aversion to, um, uh, uh, it, it not only builds confidence, but it builds a unconditional love uh, of, of uh, ourselves and how the mind works. And that love and that love and kindness, um, they can continue. I wasn't watching the, uh, the watch. <laughs> Thank you, Alexandra. So next, uh, uh, Lama Rinzin Doma, and welcome. Thank you, Rinpoche. Thank you for this invitation. It's, it's really lovely to already to listen to everyone. So what moves me about wisdom that I wish to speak about a bit is its utter inclusiveness, a path of wholeness, this is extremely important for me because of the sense I have had in the past in my life, and of course it's not entirely dissolved, of a certain, certain kinds of inner fractures. So wisdom as a path of wholeness, also as a path of real intimacy with oneself, with others, the, the good and the bad parts, as Kandrila was talking about, uh, with the world. My, one of my first teachers, um, Bakshi, different Geshe Wangyal, uh, the, um, would say in his own unique Kalmyk English that a Bodhisattva, he said, what is a Bodhisattva? Bodhisattva is a true cosmopolitan. And I've always remembered that. And I remember it especially these days when there are so many people who are put outside you know, the mandala of supposedly our society. And it, it strikes me very importantly that to speak of wholeness, as Lana Sultran did, is, is to also recognize that wholeness does not preclude variety. You know, people talk about, some people talk about, oh, we need to have a culture that's monolithic in one way or another, all male or all white or all a certain way. And it's clear, and I remember that Rinpoche said to me uh, very impactfully when we were uh, working on unbounded wholeness, and he said, well, it's because there are many that there are one. And I've always thought about that, that, that a whole, the wholeness that we're seeking, like there are five Dakinis, they're different. They're different colors, they're different elements that are associated with them. There are five wisdoms, but they're a whole, and we are different people. Um, to have a sense of inclusion is extremely important, it seems to me, at this moment. So, so my time. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was growing up, uh, there was a big secret in my house. And it took me until my 30s to actually learn anything about it. And it had to do in fact, with um, tragedy, my parents escaped from Europe, the Holocaust, all the dead relatives who I didn't even know about, but they would never talk about it. And I, I remember standing in the hall, my mother was about to braid my hair and my mother and father had some kind of interaction and somehow I knew that there was, I could feel there was something that I just didn't know. And I think that contributed to making me feel a little bit of the stranger in my own family. I mean, there was obviously something really important that I knew nothing about. And a little bit of a stranger to myself because it's my history also. So when I came to Buddhism, I didn't know that I had that issue. Uh, I just lit up one day as a junior in college. I was a, a semester abroad. India, I thought, I'll go to India. I didn't know anything about India, except that that was, was because of their children, I had to eat my vegetables. And um, so I went to graduate school just to get a little learning about India because I knew my parents wouldn't think that was a good idea. That was to make it legitimate. And I uh, met my first teacher this lifetime, Kinsar Nelwan Lakedan, who had been the last abbot in free Tibet of Yume Monastery, Tantric Monastery. Um, I went to India, I studied with 
uh, from then on for many years with great Galipa masters and met His Holiness at that time, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And I remember I <laughs> just, you know, crying like people do when they see the Dalai Lama. And that after that first audience, it seemed for a couple of days, every time I blinked, I just saw little deities in my eyes. So that was very compelling for me. Um, I also met in those early years, uh, Kids in Summer Rinpoche was my first Dzogchen teacher. And um, we talked with His Holiness about, well, was that okay? Because I was studying with all of these Kalipa teachers. And then my interest in Dzogchen also drew me to study with Rinpoche and with Loban, thankfully. And so I feel that all of my teaching, all of my being, you know, of course, is um, drawing from that. I teach because one has to focus. I teach mainly Longchen Yutik, the heart essence, the Dzogchen lineage, but I certainly feel very remake, at least for the, the reason that I know, the three, three of the six schools. And the not knowing one's own experience or wanting not to acknowledge it, as Kundalini just said, really creates a cleft in oneself. And it also creates a cleft between knowing and feeling, cognitive and somatic experience, which is a big rivet in, in our own culture. And it's also gendered. Women have always been, and I studied women's studies and feminist studies and uh, at Harvard thinking about those things. I mean, I would say, you know, the man is the mind and his mind is good and pure, smart, and the woman is the body. And they didn't mean it as a compliment. You know, the body was kind of re regressive. And so one thing about, of course, our traditions is that in, then we don't have this kind of body and mind fight in the Tibetan tradition. So that's one type of wholeness. There's cognitive somatic, there's body mind wholeness. And besides that, the, the wisdom body, or I could say the body is a body of wisdom in, 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 in our traditions. Longshin Rabchan says, wisdom suffuses the entire body. And I just think about that a lot. So as if we're gonna gender the body as feminine, and of course wisdom is feminine in, in our traditions, um, we've got quite a body. You know, it's not the flesh and bothersome and unspiritual mass that it is often thought of in this culture. It is a body uh, rich, you know, when we send our mind through it as we did in the practice, there's much to learn. There's much to learn about about our own experience. So learning to be in the whole body, and there's, there's even been research that uh, into a study of intuition, that intuition is more likely to arise when you take your attention away from your head, which it often is in our culture, and if it's in the whole body, in the whole body. And what also happens is that the space between in and out, which is another kind of partition of wholeness, uh, begins to loosen. This is not meditators. These are people who are recording intuitive experiences they have had. But I think that much the same is true in our spiritual practice. When we are relaxed, as we did in our practice, when we are expansive, we're much more likely to experience a shift in our uh, sense of wholeness, in our sense of at the seven minute or the 10 minute? Can I try to say what? I, I lost track. I started, with, should I stop? Okay, I'll stop. Thank you. You can continue. I Maybe, is it, I think it's a seven minute, I guess. <laughs> if I may, just one moment to say that I feel that, for example, in the practice of equanimity, uh, we have a wonderful coalescence. The way Longchenpa describes the four measurables, equanimity and the four measurables, equanimity is associated with two of the wisdoms. It's associated with uh, uh, the, the wisdom of sameness, 
and also Dharmadhatu. And also it's associated with a place in the body, this very deep place in the body, the navel, where Longchenpa says, that's where all the channels coalesce, that's where the cells really grow forth from. Uh, so we have feeling, bodily feeling. We have a sense of relaxation, ease and wholeness. And we also have an openness to the possibility of wisdom, all integrated. And this is true, of course, in all of the four measurables, in all of the wisdoms. They have body, they have emotion, they have feeling. So it's a wholeness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, next, uh, Sharon Salzberg, please. Welcome. Thank you so much, Rinpoche, and thank you all. It's really uh, quite wonderful to, to be hearing everybody. Um, well, my uh, background and practice is really centered in the Burmese tradition. Uh, I've had Tibetan teachers uh, always, but my main body of practice has been within Burmese practice, and my teaching is largely within Burmese tradition. Um, even as I study, you know, on my own with Tibetan teachers. So um, my first teacher was S.N. Goenka. It was a 10-day intensive retreat, as was his form. And it was a mindfulness retreat or an insight meditation retreat. And just at the very end, he taught this loving kindness meditation. And it was almost a ceremonial way of saying goodbye. And it captured my attention and I became fascinated with it. And I thought, what's that, you know? Um, because, you know, to echo Anne, as I would echo a lot of what she said, you know, I was very fragmented. I was in a lot of emotional pain. I was 18 years old uh, when I went to India. I did go as a junior in college. And uh, I, um, you know, I, I had never really looked within. And so this was my first acquaintance with myself. And I was extremely judgmental. And somehow I knew that that wasn't going to be the healing element if as I unearthed or highlighted all these various parts of myself and I disliked them and I felt ashamed and I was afraid and uh, that wasn't going to be the path. But uh, I, I did whatever I did through paying attention and trying to cultivate wisdom and seeing everything is changing or empty or whatever. Uh, but I also felt there's something out there that may be a, a very direct antidote to, to what seems to be my main issue. And I think it was my main issue because I can look back through the years. Oh, this teacher said this to me. And two years later, this other teacher said this other thing to me. And I thought, they're kind of the same, actually. You know, like, uh, so hopefully I was learning something on a deeper level all the time, but it was kind of the same thing. Um, you know, feel what you feel. This is what's happening. Uh, you can be kind to yourself anyway. If you're kinder to yourself, you'll be kinder to others. Um, this is not a selfish pursuit. Uh, this is like building resource within yourself so that you can actually pay attention so much more fully to everything. You can, you can hold the whole, you know, the difficult as, as well as the joyous. So, uh, but it was only in 1985 that I got the chance to go to Burma for three months where I first did intensive loving kindness practice. And uh, when I came back, I started teaching it in this country. So that was 1985. My first book, which came out 10 years later, was on loving kindness practice. And it was very interesting for me because not within my closest set of colleagues, but in the conventional world, in society, I immediately encountered oh, those qualities, love, loving kindness, compassion. They're so weak, you know, and they're so kind of confused and uh, the pretentious, you know, the hypocritical. Um, you'll lose discernment, you'll lose intelligence, you'll, you won't, you'll lose a fierceness, you'll lose a sense of clarity, sense of boundary, you let people hurt you, you let people hurt other people. That's, that's really, you know, it's so sentimental. It's uh, kind of sickly sweet. And, and that was fascinating um, because it was such a conventional understanding. And I'd have to say within, again, not my closest world, but within some elements of the Buddhist world, I also found a lot of resistance. You know, this is this is not a wisdom practice. You'll never see emptiness this way. You you know, this is a feel good practice. And I realized in the end that both elements were saying it's a girly practice. You know that the the notion of uh, the feminine in the conventional ordinary sense 
uh, not in specific Buddhist teaching, was very much kind of compliant and weak and meek and loving, but you know, very sweet, but not very strong. And so, uh, in some strange way, it's become such a pronounced part of my entire life's work. You know, um, to to help, I felt reclaim the word and the and the power of of the concept. And so, um, and I see it really very much in in the light of what we've been talking about to uh, to truly be able to open to the entire range of our experience, internal and external. Um, if our habit is that kind of um, judgment, um, antipathy, dislike, fear, then basically we, we probably need an antidote like that. The irony of the practice as is classically taught in the Burby's tradition is that you begin with loving kindness for yourself. And, and that's the basis for which one can then have loving kindness and compassion for others. And so uh, that just seemed wrong. I thought, what kind of spiritual pursuit is that? You know, surely you have to deny yourself and uh, have that sense of self-abnegation in order to, to embrace others and, you know, not think about others. But in truth, uh, you know, my own particular psychology was so fractured that I actually needed that in order to genuinely be able to care about the condition of others. Otherwise it was, it was an incantation. It was like a chant, you know, it was something that one said because everyone around you said, but not really, you know, it wasn't really what I was interested in. And so, um, you know, coming past the thought, well, this is wrong. This is selfish. This is, uh, this is like conceit or, or arrogance. Um, was also an enormous opening and, and to realize the power of these states. And, and I think we see the consequences in society of these states, love, compassion, kindness, generosity, uh, being considered afterthoughts or at best very weak virtues and the power of those states denied. And so uh, in some ways it's like a re-embrace of the feminine because those are associated with the feminine more than with anything. Um, and, and to recapture and own in a way the power of them, I think is something that's very important. And we live in a time certainly with uh, hatred prevailing in many ways, much more than love. And um, I, I really have come to feel that uh, love is also our, loving kindness is also our responsibility. It's like my responsibility that if we want love in a conversation, maybe we have to be the one to bring it in. And if we want compassion in an encounter, maybe we have to be the one to bring it in. So uh, I'm very much working myself with that idea of what's the responsibility that's also part of having this, this kind of understanding. So. Karen. Um, so uh, next, uh, uh, Marcy, please welcome. Thank you, Yimpache. Thank you, everyone. This has been so moving to hear everyone. I have to say, when I was first invited, it was a little agitating. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be on vacation, which I've never taken a vacation before uh, as an adult without a child, which is a lot of work, as we know. Uh, so, so here I am supposedly on vacation. <laughs> and then when this invitation came, it was like, oh, I have to do something, you know. But anyway, it has brought me to reflect on this lifetime as a, and I have to, I want to begin because that's where my path really begins is when I was very young child, my mother was a a very strict adherent of the Dr. Spock method of uh, creating a structure for a child. So it doesn't matter if you're crying, if you're hungry, oh, it's not two o'clock, it's not time to eat. Go ahead, cry it out. Anyway, uh, it was nap time. I was put down for a nap. I had my own little space and uh, I'm not tired. So what do you do? Well, I looked, I was looking at the shade, the window shade, and it had a little circle that you pull the shade, a little crocheted circle back in the 
fifties, they were very popular. And I would stare at that shade circle and my mind would get very, very calm. So that, that took some time, but not all of the nap time. So I, well, what am I gonna do? So my mother would wash the laundry and hang the sheets on the line and the wind would blow the sheets, white sheets. I thought, oh, so I imagine a white sheet, white sheet, white sheet, <sighs> coming over my mind, white coming down through my body, white, white, white. And suddenly I hear this voice in my head that says, there is more to learn about this. Your parents are not your teachers. Don't go to India. We will come to you. First of all, I don't even know what India is. I thought of American Indians on the television or something. But I did, oh, and the last thing, this is very important, was you are in the right body as a girl. So this had a big effect on me uh, for a while. I never spoke about it. But um, first of all, it was a little unsettling to think my parents were not my teachers. That's all that I knew. I didn't, I didn't know anybody else but my parents at that time in terms of helping me guide in the world. But I began to be open to, oh, there's going to be some guidance. And I would look at my nursery school teacher and my kindergarten teacher and then all my teachers. And uh, they were helpful, but they, they were not really happy people. And uh, so this was concerning. And I, and I want to say one more thing. My mother was a beautiful introduction to me to suffering. And because of that introduction to suffering, she had carried a very deep, deep suffering that wasn't articulated, but I could see it. it she would cry frequently. The, the birth of this power of compassion, how that feels in you when you really don't want someone else to suffer. Uh, so, so that was strong in me too. Anyway, when I became a young adolescent, I forgot totally about all of that. Just couldn't remember, just out of my mind. I'm just trying to navigate being a girl, being a girl whose body was changing. Suddenly people are treating me differently. They're wanting to touch me or go places with me, all kinds of things that were very confusing. And um, fast forward to being in college, I was on a skiing trip and I fell and I broke my leg very severely and ended up in the hospital in a remote place, well, in Vermont, which was remote from where I lived. And nobody came to the hospital. So I was alone by myself for a week immobile in a cast. And at that time, lying in the hospital bed by myself, I remembered that early experience. I remembered that impact of um, that I was actually seeking for guidance. I was actually seeking to, um, to know myself to be uh, and to be a fully compassionate person. And so uh, I began uh, to look at at that time in the seven, in the early 70s, different teachers were coming through uh, the United States and I would see them. Swami Satchitananda, Sri Shamoy, Swami Muktananda. And I, I realized what I was drawn to actually, uh, I did some reading was Buddhism. It spoke to me, it was my, it felt like, oh, this is the language of my experience. And so, I found out about Chögyam Trungpa, who was a little bit scary to me because he had a lot of scary hippie-like people around him. But anyway, I went out to Boulder and I took refuge with him and I began studying in the Kagyu tradition. Uh, and uh, all I really wanted to do was practice. So I kind of was very introverted and um, I went and lived at the Maitri community, the experimental community where we were looking at the mandala by lying down in these colored rooms in these shapes for four hours a day, meditating for two hours additionally, and then fighting with each other all the other time, <laughs> trying to like get along as crazy people. Anyway, that pursuit of uh, meeting the teachings at that time was such a powerful 
experience of meeting this uh, nature that, but would let it come out. It had names, for, they were names for these experiences that I had that had no relevance in my society that I could see. Suddenly they're relevant. Not only are they relevant, they're like the source of what, how you evolve as a person. So um, I was very grateful for this pointing out. And I was also sad at the same time, wow, it would have saved me a lot of suffering if someone had told me earlier. <laughs> but anyway, so I was a very uh, devoted student and a strong practitioner. And then I was, uh, became um, a teacher in the Shambhala tradition. Uh, but as uh, Sultram was saying, um, it was challenging to be a woman and I was uh, run into some difficulty, particularly for myself, I felt like I could handle it. But when I would be teaching and someone would come in, uh, they were attracted to the way I was teaching, it sounded good to them, they recognized something, and then they would come in and get um, have some very difficult experiences based on how they were treated because they were a woman. And I said, well, I can't do this. This was a very difficult situation for me. I went into retreat. Interestingly, I brought women of wisdom with me and I cried a lot in that retreat. And I read the book and I said, no, I'm a Buddhist. That's my language. I can't leave. That's my path. So I prayed to the Kuntu Zanko. I, I just didn't know what else to do. I said, please, I, I need guidance. I can't continue to teach in this way uh, when I know this is happening to people. And so um, I came out of retreat and I got a phone call the next day from a friend of mine from Naropa. She said, Marcy, there's a woman teacher. She's a Tibetan Lama and she gave me her phone number. And I called her up and she said, come tomorrow morning at seven o'clock. And I went, oh my God. <laughs> so I drove in my car and I brought some flowers and she opens the door and I was astonished because she had on this Tibetan chuba, but she had on this blouse that was made out of a bedspread or something. And it was, she had been in my dream when I was on retreat. She said, come in, she closes the door and we proceeded to have, a, I don't know, maybe a seven year relationship where she worked very, very, very strictly with me, very strictly with my mind. I did, I completed two nundros under her tutelage and, Anyway, she uh, basically had me turning again and again relentlessly to my own mind stream to what's to not even worry about what's out there or who's on the lineage tree or anything and just work with the three poisons, the central channel, just opening, opening. And so at some point, I guess my message would be if I went to stop here, even though my next incarnation was to meet Tenzin Rinpoche and that opened my life up hugely and beautifully. But it is that there is a journey within each one of us and there is wisdom that emerges constantly. And we just often aren't um, pointed towards it. It's not often valued, but it is there. It's in the openness of your being. It's in the way you resonate with the uh, expressions of others, particularly their suffering. And you should trust that and find a way to empower that and to continue to open there. So. That's, that's my pith <laughs> message. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. So I think uh, <clears throat> we, with all the speakers, I think we completed all the speakers. I just wanted to maybe, uh, here actually I wanted to don't speak. I really wanted to hear everybody, but maybe I just wanted to say a few words, if you all allow me. It's uh, that, uh, as Lama Sultan said earlier that, you know, we don't have a Tibetan uh, female teachers here in this uh, conversation. Um, it's very true, Anya, about, it was a year ago, I think we spent almost a year trying to, <laughs> trying to have them. It was so difficult trying to get contact of anybody and you send a mail, you know, no response, no responses. It's just, we just could not pull things together. We just then we, we said, okay, let's, Let's take a break and we'll try again another time. So it was it was not very easy uh, to to bring together. But I I hope that uh, to to bring the uh, Tibetan female teachers together and 
And I think the wonderful news is the next uh, conversation in September 6th is the Zhangmo um, Yangri is the one uh, female teacher. Uh, she is uh, uh, like a doctor, uh, like PhD from Saranath University. Uh, I think that, I don't know how many of them, but there I think PhD, very few uh, um, a female who have completed the PhD program there, I think. So she's the one of them. So once she finished it there, so I invited her, why don't you please come and teach at our institute in Elishu. So she has been teaching there for the last three years and she uh, is a wonderful teacher. And, uh, and during this time when we were trying to pull things together with all the lamas, because I've, I've been interested personally on in five wisdom uh, quite a lot and uh, trying to speak a little bit about it. So, uh, and I also done some research and talking with each of these campus and uh, teachers on specifically, really trying to understand a little bit more about five wisdom in each of their traditions because they are each tradition's schools that they have a different, uh, uh, how you say, explanations and practices and so on. So, so I, I was really interested. So, so I wanted to bring all of them together. And then I thought, okay, maybe some more younger, maybe I can invite her, you know? And uh, I said, I, I said, of course, there are many geishas I can invite, but I, I don't. I wanted to invite her, so I said I sent her a message saying, "What about you? What about you wanted to come? That would be really great, you know. I would really encourage you to come." And good thing is, she said, "Yes, I'm ready." <laughs> so it was like a very. It was beautiful that she was she was ready. So uh, to have this conversation among all the. Uh, geishas and lamas uh, on September 6th on representing burn tradition and talking about the specific uh, the knowledge about five wisdom from the burn tradition. So, so our translator, Tenzi Tursam, who is also gathering, oh, he said this topic is a little complicated. He wanted to talk with each teacher. So we were trying to put them together so they can talk about, the, share the text and the talk about it. Is So anyway, so I, so she's, so I'm very, very happy. But again, you know, we are six schools, and there's only one. And somebody on the Facebook said there's only one. That's not fair. There's not a balance. Yes, I, I completely agree. It's not a balance. But I just wanted to say, people there who have made that comment on Facebook or other people who feel that way, we try and we will keep on trying, and trying to bring more balance here. So thank you so much. And uh, maybe um, before conversation, uh, maybe before each of conversation, maybe each one can ask question to each other or share something more. Uh, maybe I think maybe a little silence might be good since we have been all talking quite a bit. So Marcy, can you please lead the practice? Sure. Okay. So take a moment and just feel the way you're experiencing your body. And I'm going to suggest that you gather your hands if you know a mudra of equanimity or a restful way to gather your hands to do that and to just rest your attention in the stillness of your hands. And as your mind rests in stillness, feel the sense of stillness as a permission throughout your body to release the effort, the imprint of effort. and rest in the stillness of being.
And as you rest, the stillness of being, aware that the body does not contain or confine the sense of being, releasing the boundedness and resting in openness. And as your outer voice is resting, being aware of the silence, the inner silence that you could release into, releasing the energetic imprint of speech. like a deep ocean resting in silence, allowing the currents and waves to simply be as they are. And drawing your attention into the heart center. As you rest here, feel the mind like an open sky. Throughout your heart, throughout your body, throughout the environment. Resting in the sky of your being, allowing your experience to be as it is. Aware of the spaciousness of being connected. Feel the dynamic quality of being alive, being present, the natural warmth. Feel that every aspect of your being at this moment is completely allowed to be. Nothing is excluded. And for a moment, introduce the aspiration that whatever sense of loosening, freeing, or liberation you may have tasted in this practice, 
whatever warmth of connection we dedicate it, offer it for the benefit of others. In liberating my own being, may I benefit others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Yeah, so maybe uh, I would like to open up. Uh, maybe we don't have so much time, maybe seven minutes here, so uh, seven, ten minutes. Uh, if anybody wanted to ask a question to each other or make a comment to each other, uh, please welcome. Hi. Yes. Everybody look pretty quiet. So um, I might just say something. Um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping it's it's not diffusing the conversation, but I was just thinking about um, the, the mindful uh, mindfulness uh, being a very you know popular approach in meditation at the moment, um, and I know that sometimes uh, in the Dharma it's translated as remembrance, um, and uh, I wanted to just uh, just sort of try and articulate that. Um, what what are we trying to remember? And um, you know, Charlie Krimbache used to mention that we're trying to remember what enhances us, and we're trying to forget uh, what debilitates us. And I think that's a very um, very interesting because it depends on our attitude as to what debilitates us and what what uplifts us. Um, and one of the reasons that I was talking about, uh, I read the um, verse from Nagarjuna was the idea of the, the salt not being detected in the river was that um, uh, whether we believe in Buddha nature or not, um, I hope there's some consideration in the spiritual world of a river of virtue being uh, something that's, uh, that is, uh, within all sentient beings and that if we have an opportunity to uh, taste that look at it reflect on it that those little bits of salt the unvirtuous uh things that that do uh we see as degrading uh don't have to um stop us from seeing the virtue so that you know the broadness that i think and the inclusiveness that that, that all of the speakers have included in some aspect of what they were saying um, has to do with the mindfulness of, of inclusion, you know, includes, including the, the, the beauty of uh, the Buddha nature or, or, or some prim, primordial purity, or even from an ordinary perspective uh, and not, um, uh, giving anything that's uh, personally uh, uh, has degradation, something that we don't like in ourselves or, or phenomenal or whatever, giving it uh, enough, uh, it shouldn't have any more voice than that which is expansive and uh, uplifting. So that's, I just wanted to mention. Great, thank you. Uh, any, anybody else? And you want to say something? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, one impetus from our stories for going for the Dharma is, was because we had some kind of suffering. And 
the karmic narrative you know well. But also underneath that, and I, for me, this has become very important. I really heard it in what Marcy was saying, uh, that there is this love for wisdom, you know, that somehow we know, even though we don't know, we know it's there. And, and even a whiff of it is just so, you know, you'll turn your life around. Just when I first heard about dependent arising and emptiness, Okay, I've got to have a life where I can learn more about this because this is it. This is a thing. There's nothing else is this important. And um, so that's already, you know, an opening and, and um, you know, having confidence in that, listening to that and feeling it in the body seems because that's already an intimate connection with the wisdom, as Marcy was pointing out. It's been a thread, an important thread for me and in this conversation everybody has mentioned. And anybody else wanted to just say some last minute? <laughs> okay, or maybe I think that's, uh, yeah, Marcia wanted to say something. Okay, please, please. I have to say, um, Rinpoche, that um, upon meeting you, and the way the lineage is embodied in you and through you and around you and the warmth and the generosity has supported me and many around you to be more truly authentic and contribute to our world, our society, not to leave it or renounce it, but to be in it, engaged, open-heartedly, open-mindedly. And so even today, having bringing us together and allowing for this is an example of that. So I, I'm deeply grateful, and I hope you live a very long life. Thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, we are going to uh, conclude our conversation today. I wanted to thank uh, Anya, who is behind the scene here. As you all know, she really works so hard, and this is just incredible how how much how many hours she put together to do this and also the whole TWR live team behind there. So they are, they've been doing a lot of work here. And just so the next, of course, uh, the regular thing is a Sunday, uh, I'll be teaching on um, the unification of three space. So the lab of this cycle of continuation of the teachings every Sunday, last two Sundays. So the third Sunday will be uh, unification of three space and also one, Another exciting uh, uh, conversation that we are planning. Uh, I don't know how, again, it's all this very difficult to bring these things together, especially sometimes when you have different schools, tradition, Tibetan traditions, all like you're doing, everybody is doing their own things, but coming, bringing them together, it's uh, at least on the cyber is easier to do it. <laughs> so the other thing we are trying to do is to, to bring the, from, uh, from five, continent, five, six continents, the indigenous people, the voice of indigenous people, I do feel very much that there are a lot of really older indigenous people. They're not necessarily scholars. They're not famous. They're not self-promoting thing people. They're just ordinary, simple people who are living up in the mountains. But I think we need to hear their side of the story, their voice and their message. Uh, some, sometime it might make totally sense to us, sometime it might not make sense to us, but hearing it, I think is important. And saying that also, you know, I, as a person, on a personal level, my wife telling that who we, last couple of days, we have been talking a lot also about her coming out and teaching, because basically she, she has so much to offer and uh, she, and her also and many things that she have, what she has, and she came from her mother and her mother is like her teacher. So, so it's a very much like a coming from the mother and the knowledge and this deep sense of trust, confidence, even all the stories of the dreams and the, how she reads the dream. She just basically tell everybody what to do in their life through her, through her one single night dream, you know? So, but there's such deep sense of trust. And then in fact, sometimes when they did not follow her advice, did not turn out really well. So, so somehow, so there are these really like a, a traditions that elders, people who not necessarily scholars or anything like that. I think uh, uh, we 
I feel like we need to hear them. So I don't know when it's going to happen, but sometime uh, we I hope that from like indigenous people from all around the world, we hope to bring together here. So that's a dream and it will happen. So thank you so much, all of you, just taking your time being here with us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Thank so you. Much. Thank you, everyone. Really, 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 really